All right. Okay. So take it away, Joe. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Um, before we get started, uh, we have uh, Nina with us that would like to share and, and give a plug about an upcoming event um, that, that would be of interest to this uh, data science user group. So Nina, please take it away. Thanks so much, Joe. Um, yeah, I wanted to just uh, share, uh, there's an intelligent water systems challenge that the Illinois Water and Environment Association is hosting. It's uh, based off a competition that's been taking place at the national level. And the Illinois Water Environment Association is doing it now at the state level here in Illinois. And it's the first time the challenge is taking place. It's open to any students, undergraduate or graduate students that are interested in using uh, advanced analytics, AI and ML to solve actual water and wastewater operation systems challenges. And so um, I wanted to go ahead and share that with this group. Um, the, uh, there's an info session at 8 p.m. on October 6th for any students that are interested in finding teammates and finding mentors. It's just kind of a general Q&A to sort of get people plugged into the right uh, group if they're interested in participating in this challenge. And um, you know, once you find a team, then um, and of course, you're free. Uh, feel free to find your own team uh, and mentors as well. But if you'd like assistance on that, there is a Q&A this coming um, October 6th. I believe that's Wednesday uh, of next week at 8 p.m. And uh, uh, submissions are due. Um, well, the initial submission, which really does just involves stating your team members, uh, is due uh, October 16th. And then there'll be some check-ins with mentors if you're interested. And the final submission is due uh, February of uh, next year. And the final round of the competition will be at the Illinois Water um, Wastewater Professionals Conference in Springfield in uh, April of next year. And there's uh, cash prizes for the winning teams. And I think very few teams have registered so far. So there's a good chance of winning a cash prize if you're interested. And this is an area, I, I'm a wastewater professional that works in the advanced analytics space. It's an area that's really um, hot right now in the water and wastewater sector. And people are really looking forward to seeing how advanced analytics can be used to actually solve problems in the wastewater and water fields. So um, I just wanted to sort of share that. The only requirement is that it, it should be an Illinois, a student, uh, an Illinois, I guess, resident that's going, uh, a, that's a student out of state or an in-state Illinois student, you know, university student. So you have to kind of have some connection to Illinois and only one member of the team needs to have that connection. And so um, I think um, if it, uh, you know, if you have students in your department that are interested or might be interested, if you could share this information, I shared the kind of links and things with uh, you, Joe. I don't know if there's a way to share it with the group in case people are interested. There's a Zoom link to attend the Q&A session. There's a link to learn more about the challenge. Um, if you don't have a problem or data set, there's a link to some uh, sample problems and data sets that you could use to, you know, uh, work on this challenge if you, you know, if you wanted to work on that or you can create your own. Um, so I think there's lots of flexibility, but really the industry wants to see some, um, you know, novel use cases of using advanced analytics for solving problems in our field. Awesome. Thanks so much, Nina. And I realize maybe, um, I mean, this is recorded, so people will be able to see it, um, but as people are slowly joining us, um, maybe we should have done at the end um, so that we can maximize the exposure. With that said, Matt, is there a way for, I, I mean, I can definitely put information in the chat, but um, can we like append information onto the meetup page or or is there any way yeah, to do that? There is a message board we can put, I think any member can put stuff on there. So you okay. I mean, could post there or, or I could post the information as well if that doesn't work. Okay, sounds, sounds great. Because um, it seems, seems like a really cool event and cash prizes are always great, so. Uh, students, you know, they need, uh, well, we all kind of need cash at times. All right. So thank you, Nina. And uh, so next up, we have the, uh, the main event. Um, I was going to go through each person's bio, um, but I'm just going to uh, paste it into the chat um, since uh, you've all seen it at the meetup link. Um, but I do want to read the details of the presentation really quickly. Uh, so for our October meetup, we are excited to welcome three leaders and researchers from the College of Media at the University of Illinois. They're also uh, friends of mine, uh, Eva Meslowska, Jacob T. Fisher, and Harsh Taneja. They will be presenting on the crucial role that data science plays in understanding the digital world 
In their presentation, they will provide several examples illustrating how advertising and media researchers apply data science to better understand user behavior, evaluate marketing activities, and identify effective strategies and target audiences. And so this is really cool. Um, and we have a three for one today. And normally we have like one speaker, but we've got uh, three uh, experts in the field. And so without any further ado, um, I will let, maybe I think Ava is probably starting, but whoever would uh, like to start the presentation, please feel free to share a screen and take it away and I will paste everyone's bios. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. We didn't coordinate, I have to admit. <laughs> so, no problem, please. <laughs> it's very spontaneous. So I shared my screen. Hopefully that's working. I've n I never use Google Slides, so this yep. is my we can see experience it. for me. Perfect. Uh, so thank you all for, for having us here today. And I know we're on a tight schedule and we laughed with, jo with Jacob yesterday that academics are not, very are not the best at being brief, but we're trying. <laughs> Um, so this is us, you know, our bias, and I will start. Um, Joe already introduced me. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Advertising. And what I study, um, like my focus is on two main research areas. One is personalization and targeting. So how can we predict who the recipients of our messages are? when it comes to the interests, personalities, political preferences, et cetera, can we address them more successfully if we personalize our messaging? And does it work across different contexts? So I study mostly marketing communication, but I, I've also studied health communication, political communication, uh, misinformation. Another research area is, uh, deals with consumer engagement, so how people, consumers engage with information and with different actors such as brands, um, especially on social media. But a big chunk of my research is devoted to online customer reviews. Um, today, I won't be able to talk about everything, obviously. So if you have any questions, please feel free to follow up with me. I'm always happy to chat. Today, I will focus on personalization. This is a hype term. A hyper term is psychological profiling or personality marketing. And you probably have heard about it, you must have, if you live in the US, because of the huge scandal with Cambridge Analytica, how they harvest Facebook profiles to predict certain pers uh, personal characteristics and then allegedly address consumers with messages that fitted those characteristics. Now, what we're trying to predict and target is often personality, but sometimes it's emotional state. So are people currently happy, unhappy? Uh, that's what Spotify is doing. That's what many magazines are trying to do uh, or newspapers. We also try to tap into values, motivations, needs, susceptibilities to persuasion. We know that some people respond better to, for example, scarcity. Others respond better to um, authority and political affiliations. Um, the idea here is that we can use digital footprints um, to predict these um, personal characteristics. Now, it's nothing new, actually. So the model that's based on comes from the 50s when um, actually it happened offline when people were asked or judges were asked to evaluate, to use different cues uh, from bedrooms, offices, or physical spaces to evaluate or judge someone's personality. And this is the, the same idea is now being applied in the online or digital world. So we use different cues, like for example, from social media, number of friends, um, affect that people express in the comments or posts, um, humorous pictures, et cetera, to evaluate the personality. So we can use these cues to say whether someone is, for example, extrovert or introvert. Um, the idea here is that these cues really represent the target's personality. And we have, there's been lots of research that kind of tries to tap into different personal characteristics. So uh, especially um, researchers at the University of Bath, they've done also some critical and systematic reviews of that literature. So if, you, if that's something that you're interested in, I can definitely recommend some articles. Now, what we, 
what the example that I will show you, um, try to do is something similar. So we wanted to kind of put together the different pieces of information that we have on consumers to predict their pre uh, political preferences. The idea here is that obviously in the ideal world, we would have all that information about consumers. So what they, what they consume, what they like, what the demographics are, the engagement behaviors, um, purchases, and also context variables like with whom they usually consume media, when, why, and things like that. Unfortunately, we don't have that information. So what we try to do, we have, fortunately for consumers, unfortunately for companies. Uh, so we, what we try to do, we take pieces of information that we have, and then we try to predict different qualities of consumers or people, um, and then address those. The idea here is that we can, this way we can kind of tap into that potential receptiv receptivity to personalize or addressable advertising and then decide what kind of version of an ad to show or where to place it. And hopefully serve like stop serving wrong ads to wrong people. Um, so what we did, this is the case study, which is not the newest, I have to admit. Uh, I'm still working on similar studies, so that's why I always enjoy presenting this one. And uh, for the sake of uh, being brief, I will um, go quickly through what, we, what we've done, but I'm happy to share the paper if you're interested in details. Um, so I worked on it together with Ed Moldhaus and Judy Franks from Northwestern University. And our idea here was to use TV consumption data, so again, our footprints, to predict political preferences and then ta for targeting purposes. And we focused on political advertising because of, for, because of opportunistic reasons, that's the data we had, but also because political advertising is, uh, is, an, is very important. It's, uh, it's lots of money, especially in the US in like 2016. So that's the year that we dealt with. Um, it was almost $10 billion spent on political advertising. We studied 46,000 households in Texas uh, and calculated watch time of 300 programs representing different genres. We got that information from set -up box data from one of the companies we collaborated with. Um, we also had demographic information and we had uh, voting records because that's something that's public in the US. We didn't know whether, uh, which particular candidate someone voted for, but we didn't know whether they registered as blue or red. Um, we had that for primary and for general elections in 2016. So what we found was that you know, demographics didn't do great. Um, our accuracy was about 0.66. Um, when, it when it comes to past voting behavior, that was the most predictive. That's not surprising, right? Um, people have very strong political affiliations, which are pretty stable especially when we talk about systems like in the US or UK, where we only have two, we have more, but let's say we have two main parties. Um, but the viewing behavior was actually pretty uh, predictive as well and uh, did much better than demographics themselves. The best model was when we included all of the information that we had, so viewing demographic and past behavior, um, but viewing itself, so content that people consume was predictive. Um, was much more predictive than demographics. So um, what was surprising for us, as uh, those of you who are not familiar with media planning, normally we uh, plan media and buy advertising based on maybe day parts. So do we want to advertise in the morning or in the afternoon or genres? But it seems that we should actually be focusing more on the program itself. So really the unique plot and personality of a TV show. Some of the results that we found were pretty obvious, right? Especially when it comes to news, like Fox News versus CNN or MSNBC. But we also found differences when it comes to other uh, reality TV or TV shows. So for example, The Kardashians versus The Dark Dynasty or Alaska, The, the Last Frontiers. Um, what we also found um, that was quite interesting is that it was easier to predict party affiliation in the primary than voting in the general election which may have to do with um, 2016, that specific <laughs> election that we dealt with, uh, where people were more likely maybe not to vote according to their uh, political preferences. 
when it comes to the models, since this is a <laughs> data science meetup, uh, what we found was that we compared three different models, logistic, um, lasso logistic, and random forest, and actually lasso performed the best, which is not surprising considering um, like how it um, penalizes right? um, predictors uh, in a way. And when we look at logistic, actually it performed pretty well, very close to Lasso, which was uh, quite interesting. We didn't have like overfitting issues. Um, to summarize and let my colleagues talk a little bit as well, I would just say that it seems that we can now use not only digital footprints, but we can also use TV consumption. Um, and what we view, including non-political content that does provide insights into who we are, who we vote for, what our political preferences are. And this is in line with a recent publication from Neumann and others who really looked at the effectiveness of third party consumer profiling and showed that profiling based on demographics is not working very well. So if our conclusion is if you have like previous behaviors, that's the best to use. But if you don't, consumption's behaviors may be much better than demographics or um, targeting. Um, finally, with, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm working on predicting other behaviors as well, like political preferences are mostly binary. Now we're working also on predicting personal characteristics, which is work in line with um, work done by Mats, Kosinski, Stilwell. Um, but the, the other one thing is to predict this uh, characteristic. Another thing is to gain value from, uh, from targeting them um, in an ethical way. Um, and that's something that we're still working on. It seems there, there are very mixed results. Sometimes it seems that's working. Sometimes it, it, research shows that's actually not very effective. So maybe it's not worth the effort and the money. Um, but maybe also if we can properly measure some consumers' context-specific experiences, then maybe we don't need all this like all that data and all the complicated uh, models to predict specific personalities. Okay, so that was a quick uh, overview of this study, and maybe I can let Jacob talk now. <laughs> I don't know, Jacob, do you want to share your screen? I can stop sharing. Yeah, probably that'd be the best option. It's just to have you stop and we just share and pick up yeah. at the same spot. Cool. Let me thank you, Abel. Pull up, pull that was unbelievably a perfect combination of you are brief, but you included so much information. So thank you. I hope not too much. That's my tendency. Oh. <laughs> Very great. It's in our lot of pressure to be on time. <laughs> We're not good at it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. I assume you all can see that just fine. Yes, sir. And hear me just fine. Awesome. Yep. Okay. So I'll present something a little bit different. So I a lot of my research is on the media psychology side and media neuroscience. I'm interested in a lot of topics having to do with human computer interaction and interface design and basically how digital design features, digital content features influence how we pay attention, how we make decisions and how we can make media better for certain types of psychological outcomes we might want. Like focusing better or being more engaged in a particular piece of content. So um, the reason that I kind of got into what I'm doing is that I realized that even though we talk about attention a lot in media studies, and it's kind of a, it's a core component in a lot of the theories that we use when we talk about media, there hasn't really been a lot of direct attention paid to attention. Um, so understanding attention and cognitive control, which is basically just attention in the face of potential alternatives. So when we kind of have to think about where we're paying attention, and inhibit distractors. It's critical to understanding how we understand media, but there are a lot of questions here, like how people pay attention to media, why people pay attention to certain things over other things. And then also what are the effects of certain content features, certain design features, like if you introduce a UI pop-up of some kind, how will that influence people's attention? And then also, and something that I'm particularly interested in is when we're in a media context and we have a bunch of things going on at the same time, like let's say we're on our phones and we're looking at, a, at the computer and maybe we also have multiple different windows open. How do we decide what's important? How do we decide what to pay attention to? And then kind of the, the capstone of all of this ultimately is trying to make recommendations for how we can design media that guide attention in more helpful ways. So we've all kind of had this experience of 
starting on doing a media task or doing a task on media where we're having to write a paper or answer an email and then we find ourselves a couple hours later 25 pages deep in wikipedia somewhere because our attention has been fragmented by whatever's happening online so i do a lot of work in this area and one of the other reasons that i've done work in this area and some of the findings of this work is that from the cognitive psychology side, there's been a lot of interest recently in understanding how people pay attention in more real world sorts of tasks. So if you've ever participated in a psychology experiment, especially as it relates to attention, they're very, very tightly constrained, very, very sort of, you're picking one arrow direction over the another arrow direction repeatedly over and over and over and over. And these tasks tend to be pretty tedious. They tend to be pretty difficult. So there's been a lot of interest from the cognitive neuroscience and cognitive psychology side in developing research paradigms that let us get people a little bit more engaged and also let us more approximate real world attention and real world behavior kind of out of taking it out of the lab and into the real world. And these naturalistic stimuli, like it's kind of the catchword that's used for media stimuli like video games and movies and other sorts of things. There's See, it shows that they actually generate more rich responses, especially neural responses. So putting someone in a brain imaging scanner and scanning their brain while they're watching a movie versus completing some traditional cognitive psychology task, there's richer neural responses. These neural responses are more reliable. They more accurately can distinguish between different individuals and between the same individual doing different tasks. So it seems like these mediated tasks are actually useful, not only for understanding media itself, but also for helping us understand how the human brain works. So especially how the human brain works in the real world when doing tasks that we would do on a day-to-day -day basis. And then this is also a path toward addressing what's kind of been a buzzword within the psychological research community in the last few years is the reliability paradox, where basically you can get really reliable results within a particular research paradigm, but that those results don't seem to actually tell us that much about behavior outside of that particular paradigm. A lot of this came out of the literature with what's called brain training, where they'll have people do a work memory task or something like this over and over to have them improve in the task. And it turns out it doesn't actually help them improve on anything else. The improvement is restricted to within that particular task. So obviously this is a big issue. And that led me to the research paradigm that I'm going to talk to you about today, where we had this thought that we could balance the need for control in understanding human decision making and human attention with more ecological validity, which basically in the research world just means is this actually valid in, in the real world, whenever we take somebody out of the lab and have them do a task that's nothing like the task that we just had them do to the same principles actually generalized to this new task. So we wanted to avoid swinging too far in the opposite direction by developing some sort of task that is just like the real world, maybe like watching a movie or something like this, but doesn't have that much experimental control. You can't really tell the differences between two stimuli because there are too many differences. The differences are correlated with each other. And video game paradigms here are a good happy medium, which is why I've dealt primarily in video games with my research so far because they allow us to directly modify the task. So we can take a video game program and we can program in different options. We can change the user interface. We can change the goals. We can change the rules. We can change the context, the backstory, pretty much anything within that particular task can be changed in a fairly precise way. And these are also good for large scale and more remote data collection opportunities, which obviously over the last couple of years has been especially helpful. And then, but the caveat here is that they can require some development skill. They require things like server architecture and other things that require some data science or even just data infrastructure that a lot of researchers don't have access to. So we built a game um, called Asteroid Impact that we originally developed it in Python in a module called Pygame. But it turned out Pygame doesn't do too well remotely. It runs really well on local computers, but doesn't run too well on a browser. So over the last year, I moved it from Pygame into Unity, which you've ever, if you've ever done development in VR or video games or anything like this, I'm sure you've heard of Unity. It's one of the more popular programs. And we tested it online, which I'll talk to you a little bit about today. And this game is nice for research because it lets us manipulate reward, cognitive and perceptual load, and several other things. So the load that we have, um, how cognitively loading, how much working memory it takes, 
And then you can also collect data like reaction times, in-game events, and we can get it, get it down to a 10 millisecond resolution. So if we're collecting data, um, we can get every 10 milliseconds a new line of data reliably, which is nice. And then it's accurate compared to other tools, things that people use traditionally in research like Psych Toolbox and PsychoPy and ePrime and all these other, if you've ever done experimental research, you've probably heard of these things. So the study that we did is we did three experiments. We did one in a lab where we brought a bunch of undergrads into a lab and had them play this game on desktop computers. We also did a study where we had people play Asteroid Impact in a brain imaging scanner where we scanned their brain while they played the game, looking at different attention-related networks and attention-related processing. And then we also had them play the same conditions of the game online in a later experiment. And we were really interested in here in how media can, whoops, um, we manipulated cognitive and perceptual load, um, which basically by manipulating the UI in different ways to increase the amount of cognitive load they had to put into the task, like how hard they had to concentrate, and also how difficult the task was to see or to pay attention to. And we also measured the variability of people's reaction times, which is a good indicator of severity of ADHD symptoms. It's a pretty uh, reliable indicator of how much somebody has attention problems is how variable their reaction times are to different tasks within the game. And we also measured the efficiency of the connections within their brain, which is just the um, average correlation of all the different nodes within a brain network, which is different areas of the brain. We took and we looked at the neural time series and we looked at the correlation between those neural time series to determine the brain and we were interested in whether cognitive and perceptual load in this media environment had different effects in ADHD than they did in non-ADHD. And long story short, we found that, which was nice. Um, so in the first experiment, we showed that their in-game performance for folks with ADHD was worse under cognitive load than for our non-ADHD folks, but that it flipped under perceptual load where our folks with ADHD performed better than our not ADHD folks. And then we also looked showed the same thing for reaction time variability, that under cognitive load, they were more variable, although this difference was not significant here, but we did replicate it in the third experiment and showed that they are significantly different. And then they also showed under perceptual load, ADHD was less variable. So this indicates that whenever we increased the perceptual complexity, it actually helped the folks with ADHD perform better, uh, perform at or above the level of non-ADHD. So this gives us an indicator that media design can be used to adapt to certain individuals to improve their performance. And we showed the same for brain network efficiency and connectivity, where under baseline and cognitive load, our people with ADHD had lower brain network efficiency, which means that the overall connectivity, how much different regions of the brain are firing in sync with one another was lower, but that under perceptual load, there, was, there were no differences between the, the non-ADHD and the ADHD group. And these are just connectivity matrices within different brain networks that relate to attention. If you're interested in those, I'm glad to talk about those too. And then this is just the replication of that first experiment where we did it online. And I honestly, whenever we built this experiment online, I didn't really expect it to work out, honestly, um, because it was super not controlled. We just flung the game onto people's computers and had them play it at home. Um, but it actually worked out more strongly than the in-person experiment but suggests that maybe having this um, in-person, maybe incentivized people with ADHD to be a little bit less ADHD whenever they're playing the game than they would at home. But we showed here that under baseline and cognitive load, our ADHD people performed worse in the game, but it was the opposite under perceptual load. And we replicated the reaction time variability findings where people with ADHD were more variable under cognitive load and less variable under perceptual load. So what does this mean? It uh, means that we can use video games, media scholars and psychologists and whoever else can use video games to investigate attention processes. And they also provide a means of embedding traditional cognitive and attention tasks within a really motivating context. The, we did this experiment, when we did this experiment online, the participants frequently reported in the free response boxes, like this is the most fun online experiment I've ever done because um, they were able to actually just play a video game. And you can also collect time-locked neural and behavioral data, which is useful for a variety of reasons. And then currently we're working on validating it um, compared to other 
cognitive load, cognitive control and attention tasks. And we're also working on scaling it um, using a containerized server architecture, which looks a little bit like this. So this is kind of the central data science element of this project right now is that we're working to deploy um, whenever we initially deployed it, we just built the server um, and that server was located out in California where I did my PhD and it worked decently well to collect the data, but there were some lag issues when people were far from the server um, or whenever they had really slow, really outdated um, either internet or hardware. And we're working on right now, we actually just have it, we just launched it this week. Um, we have Asteroid Impact deployed in a stateless containerized architecture on Google Cloud Run where we're using Firebase um, and basically a containerized stateless architecture to make it to where anybody can access the game anywhere. And it's going to be just about the same speed and multiple people can play the game at the same time without lag or without increased slowness from uh, multiple people being on the server at the same time. And then we're hoping to start collecting data on this in spring 2022. And that is it for my proportion of the talk. So I guess I can pass it on to Harsh. Thank you so much, Jacob. And uh, while Harsh gets his, uh, Harsh, will you be sharing your screen as well? Yes. Awesome. So while Harsh shares the screen. Um, okay. Again, I, I just... hope people can hear me all right. And then... Yep. All right. Thank you, Joe. So let's see. Yep, we can see it too. Brilliant. So, yeah, I am kind of going to present a specific study, which, which is actually interesting because it's, it's very different from the kind of stuff that I normally do. And it's also a project that I have actually only presented once before ever before this, even though I worked on it a long time ago. But but this was a good crowd to bring it on. So, so we are specifically looking at the larger question of does media coverage impact place brands or the brand of a specific place. But I think the more interesting element which I'll focus on here in this study is how to do that. We sort of were able to design the European refugee crisis as a natural experiment. So many of you may remember this picture from the news. So the European refugee crisis of 2015 was a very moving and sort of internationally, you know, interest arousing event. So specifically, this crisis was basically when Hungary, Romania, Czech Republic and Slovakia decided to close their borders to prevent refugees from Syria to cross into Germany. And many people kind of estimated that this was the highest level of force displacement of people since the Second World War. And this crisis kind of peaked in 2015 as 200,000 migrants crossed from Greece to Hungary. And on 13 July 2015, Hungary actually began building a border fence with Serbia. Of course, there have been a lot of other conversations about border walls and fences since, but uh, in September, actually, they declared their intent to prosecute illegals. And there were a lot of protests and intense negative international media coverage, especially in the English press about Hungary. So, so we kind of conceptualized that Hungary faced some kind of a reputation exam here, if you think of the nation of Hungary as a brand. So, so conceptualizing Hungary as a place brand, our hypothesis was that the 2015 European refugee crisis and the crisis here now we specifically mean is the crisis of negative media coverage of Hungary would adversely affect its place brand. And then of course, a follow up question that if this hypothesized effect is indeed true, then does this price, this sort of impact persist after the immediate upshot of the crisis? So, so actually, when the student 
who worked on with me on this project came to me with this as a question she was interested in. I actually helped her design this as a natural experiment because how we can apply sort of the ideas of causal inference and natural experiment to real world settings like this was a methodological interest of mine that I was just beginning at the time. So just quickly, my conception of natural experiment here is classic textbook where an unexpected event or external reason assigns participants randomly to potential treatment or control. And the specific way to model natural experiments that I am looking at here is dif uh, differences in different specification where outcomes and treatments have two time periods each before and after the unexpected event. So if you see in this table, you have a treatment group and a control group, which at time one, both are not treated. And at time two, the treatment group becomes treated and control group is still not treated. The difference being that this is all from natural events. This is not done in a lab or simulated in any way. So, so here, how we conceptualize this as a natural experiment is that we think of Hungary and the specific media coverage that it got as the treatment and Romania as a control. Because if you see with respect to the crisis, now you can argue that there are obviously a lot of differences between Hungary and Romania, but with respect to this refugee crisis, and the policies that they enacted and how it impacted the flow of refugees trying to grow, go from Syria into Germany. These two countries were very similar, but Hungary attracted bad press internationally from the English press. Romania did not. So, so the idea was that if we can assess the global Twitter sentiment about each of these countries in the period before, during, and after the crisis, this would actually, we could implement a natural experiment design with the differences in difference specification here. So if you see, we say Hungary and Romania, we basically look at the Twitter sentiment about each of these countries during these sort of two periods. That was the basic design of the study. So how we did this? The first thing was we have to establish the crisis because if we cannot convincingly establish the inflection point, then this is not a natural experiment design. So that was the first thing we did. So since our focus was sort of negative coverage in the international press, we, look, we looked at several others, but to formalize the analysis, we chose sort of New York Times and The Guardian because they both sort of represent are you know are very representative of sort of liberal international media sentiment in the english speaking world so one from uk one from the us and you can kind of clearly see that looking at articles about these countries throughout the 2015 year and early into 2016 you can see that there is a period of june to october where media coverage about hungary significantly outsizes the coverage about Romania. So we use this as a basis of establishing the crisis that, that this basically negative coverage about Hungary which started in June is the reputation exam that they are facing or is the negative media coverage about them. You can see that Romania actually does not see nearly the same level of spike and we actually looked at the sentiment of, we actually analyzed the content of all these articles to, to establish that most of them were actually pretty negative. Then the next step of the analysis was to, to test the hypothesis to collect and analyze the Twitter sentiment about both these countries. So we relied on sort of the streaming API. So we obviously don't have all the tweets, but we thought we had a good corpus of, you know, random sample of tweets, which contained the word Romania and Hungary. We looked only at English language, which we thought was reasonable to do here because our press coverage was also restricted to the English language press. And we looked at random samples of tweets 
we were able to include 47,000 tweets and 26,000 with Hungary and Romania respectively. We conducted automated sentiment analysis using a variety of methods for formal analysis. We we used two tools, SentiStrength, Lexicoder, but then we also randomly selected 200 tweets and did human coding with them to validate the machine coding. We found pretty good agreement. And just a disclaimer, I'm generally not a fan of sentiment analysis myself. But And then we also removed all the tweets that were by media organizations from this corpora, because if other sort of, you know, independent variable is media coverage, then we don't want to include sort of sentiment by the media themselves in our outcomes. So just, just to give you a volumetric sense of the sentiment before we move to the modeling, you can see that, you know, negative sentiment about Hungary actually spiked significantly during the crisis period compared to Romania. But moving beyond this, so sort of the differences in different specifications, our outcome is simply whether or not the tweet is negative. So we use a logistic specification within differences and difference. And then our predictor variables are basically a series of dummies that depict either the country or the time or the interaction of the two. So basically it's having these interaction terms like country times the period of the crisis that you move from a simple first difference to actually a differences in different specification. And then we had another control for Romania had other political protests that were unrelated to the refugee crisis during a part of this period. So we have another dummy to control for that. So, so what we found with this was that the refugee crisis time period actually sort of predicted an increased probability of a negative tweet about Hungary by, you know, 22%. And post crisis also the effect remained somewhat significant, but the effect size was sort of reduced. So this is the sort of formal hypothesis testing part of it. But then we actually also did some, you know, topic modeling using, using LDA to, to try to see what were the, you know, what were the discussions focusing on. And you could actually see that. And then we broke those also down by the three sort of periods that we established in our analysis, the before, during, and after. And you can see that during the crisis, Clearly, the bulk of the discussion related to Hungary was focused on the refugee crisis, but that topic did not function or did not figure in, you know, the discussions about Romania. So this kind of lends further validity to what we found with the sentiment analysis. But then the, the next part of this is that we want to sort of drill down more to even firmly establish that the crisis precipitated the negative sentiment. And to do that, we kind of isolated the tweets that were specifically about the refugee crisis from this whole corpora and redid the differences and difference design. So if you just see kind of a quick example there, so we were using LDA able to sort of just isolate all crisis related tweets for both countries. And then when we kind of redid the design or rerun the logistic regression and the analysis, you again sort of find that it, on tweets related to the crisis, the effect replicates of the negative media coverage. So which, with which we are kind of able to say that this negative sentiment actually applies to the crisis related tweets and still differentiates between the two countries. And this little spike that you see about Romania later on is actually related to the Romanian protests, you know, not so much to the 
and we don't observe the kind of differences in other topics when we looked at the tourism and the miscellaneous related tweets. We only see the difference for the refugee crisis related tweets. So, so sort of finally, and I'm just, you know, ready cut this short, I could go into details about other, each of these aspects if people want. So we do find that, you know, negative media coverage about Hungary did adversely affect its sentiment on Twitter and no such effect for Romania, which, as I said, you know, was was similar in all its respects to Hungary with regards to the crisis. And a small effect persisted after. And to me, sort of thinking further about this as a media scholar, Actually, I think of this more as sort of a larger question of agenda setting that are traditionally influential legacy news media. Are they still influential in actually setting the agenda that gain traction and get discussed on social media? You know, To me, more than a branding problem, actually, this is a more interesting experiment in agenda setting and why I feel compelled to continue liking the study is because I think this type of a quasi-experimental design in a natural setting is very rarely used in research in our field. So that's it from me. I guess I can stop sharing my screen. Awesome. Thank you so much, Harsh. And thank you um, to Jake and Eva. Um, I'm going to open up the floor to anybody that has questions. You can either write it in the chat or um, you can just uh, unmute yourself and speak up. And if you don't have questions, I'll ask my own. Uh, but uh, I'd, I'd love to give you all a chance first. OK, well, um, especially in the interest of time, because we only have seven minutes left. Um, I'll, I'll start first with Harsh. I'll just kind of go backwards. And if we have time, we get everybody. Um, you know, you mentioned this quasi-experimental design and, and you mentioned uh, causal inference in the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think I see a lot of causal inference um, methodology in the data science world, right? Um, you know, we talk about machine learning and all these things, and yet uh, it's kind of like uh, we don't take that final jump into what's causing what, right? Like what, what is driving what? Um, because mm -hmm. I think we're just fine with correlation. Um, to a certain degree. Um, so, you know, do you have any thoughts as to why you may, um, you don't, why maybe in data science as a whole, this is kind of crazy to ask, but, you know, um, why there isn't much more causal inference, um, you know, interest in application? I think, so maybe the, if you look at, I think, like commercial data science, so if it was safe to say that, you know, this is, a lot of it is put into use and in, either sort of teams that do data science within platforms or companies that, you know, mostly work with platform like data or trace data and all, I think you guys are able to sort of do AB tests type of experiments so frequently that it's, I mean, trying to think about observational causal inference is not that much of a concern, right? It's, it's more of, so if you can actually do these type of A-B tests and all, then why would you need to, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. It's kind of that. like a, yeah, it's kind of like a, it, it's, it's interesting for theory testing, but for day-to-day -day industrial application, especially with regards to efficiency, it's not necessarily um, needed, right? And so. Yeah, and I think the other thing is that if you see even, I am not, like if I try to think of the wider field of sort of media communication, advertising research, I can't think of a single sort of notable journal in our field that has in the last five to 10 years published using sort of observational causal inference type of methods, you know? But yeah. where this is very popular is, for example, in the field of education, because they kind of have to work with starting from very basic questions like, does going to college make you better on the labor market? You are not going to randomly not send a few people to college to 
test that effect, right? You have to work with data that exists on people actually going to college and actually being on the labor market. So which is why these methods are all much more popular there. And even textbooks about it are mostly written by people who are kind of applied econometrists who work in, you know, these areas. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks, Harsh. Okay, there's a question from um, Hugh. So a question for the presenters, could these techniques be used to help construction workers, miners, or other workers better see, identify, and recognize workplace safety hazard hazards? I'll open it up. Can any of you comment on that? Our thoughts? I could say something. I mean, I think it depends on the what sort of hazards you're you're looking for, but with any sort of, especially like what Harsh was just talking about with causal inference. I mean, some of these hazards, you don't know their hazards until you have a lot of data showing that, oh wait, this particular piece being loose in this place at this time would lead to some negative event. So I think definitely if you applying some of these things of, especially causal inference, what, what Harsh talked about would be, if you can identify a large enough source of data that you can get um, sort of which changes or which equipment malfunctioning in which ways lead to especially negative events or hazards. I think you could lead to, you could create some some really good data to, to help, especially hazards that might not be necessarily obvious where you can isolate out sources of things that could be potentially harmful that you may not even, like of course you see the big flashing lights and things that you can point out as harmful, but the things that you may not see as harmful, obviously, I think these Thing, especially what Harsh talked about could be especially helpful. Yeah, actually, that's a really good, um, thanks, Jacob, uh, for that thought. Um, yeah, I still think causal influence, influence or inference, as we just said, um, is underutilized because that's another perfect situation where you're not going to do an experiment to see, okay, let's see if this causes a hazard or not, right? You're just going with the data and you know that hazards happen, right? Um, and then, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, What's accidents happen. Um, and so how can you look back on the data and figure out where is this coming from, right? Um, I think that's something that's just not that um, handled in data science, at least from an industry application standpoint. Definitely econometrics, the, those that are studying econometrics um, are looking into this, you know, um, at, at length, but that's a really good, good question, Hugh. Any others? I'll ask one more. Um, I'll just go to Jacob next then. Um, with regards to using video games um, for studies, and I think this is a really interesting, you know, you have eSports now, and um, you know, that has a lot to do with just what's reality in life and where, where, where are we going? And then there's data everywhere with regards to that. Um, you know, I don't know, what do you see with regards to how video games interact with um, just our everyday life and uh, what what uh, new things can this bring into the data science realm? I think there are a lot of different potential angles. I mean, video games are useful for, I mean, I talked about it kind of in the, the cognitive and perceptual sense, but they're even, I mean, in some ways, even more useful for understanding things like social behavior um, and how people collaborate, how people make decisions in groups, how people, especially whenever like in the face of threat or in the face of competition. Uh, so this is definitely something I think as we uh, start to see, especially the more massively online games and things like, I don't know, with Facebook announcing metaverse and increasing things of like Roblox and Fortnite and these big sort of parallel universe games. Um, I think depending on the extent to which companies are willing to share data or researchers have a seat at the table in these sorts of large experiments with lots of people changing UI in certain ways, doing different things. I think it could lead to a lot of new understanding when it comes to understanding human behavior, understanding how people think, how people make decisions. Um, but it's just, I mean, I think as with a lot of things in the media space, it just depends a little bit on how much researchers that are not motivated for necessarily the company's bottom line what, what whether they have a seat at the table to access the data for understanding or for so i think that'll be kind of the uh the deciding factor yeah 
Well, awesome. Also, if, if we are all in a simulation, then that also probably affects things as well. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so if we could all just thank our presenters today um, and, uh, and uh, our next meeting will be again uh, the first Friday of the next month. And so we do hope that you uh, join us for that. And um, as we close again, um, the, these individuals are here on our campus. And so please, if you'd like to follow up with them with any questions um, individually, please feel free to do so. So thank you everybody and have a wonderful rest of, or have a wonderful weekend.